Thank you, Fawn, and thanks to Modern Healthcare for hosting this timely and important conversation. Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield is a not-for-profit healthcare company serving individual, business, and government customers in the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Northern Virginia. The company's mission is to drive affordability, access, and equity in healthcare for the communities we serve. We are proud to support members in the commercial, Medicaid, and Medicare Advantage markets. I want to start with a disclaimer. This is a briefing, a conversation that's intended to be a constructive piece on where healthcare is today and where I see it going. This is not an indictment of any practitioner, health system, payer, government agency, or policymaker. I believe to my bones that we cannot make progress unless we are willing to engage in candid conversations about what we do well, what we do not do well, and why. If I say something that bothers a viewer, please know that I did not intend to upset anyone, but rather to cause us to think about things potentially in a different way. I'm gonna be provocative because we need to have this conversation more often and in more settings where health insurers and healthcare delivery organizations come together. With all that out of the way, I want to acknowledge that the topic Modern Healthcare has selected for today's session is massive, and they've generously given me a lot of time. So let's divide the next 30 or so minutes into logical segments. First, how do we arrive at the collective understanding that healthcare in the United States must change? I'll review the legislative and regulatory drivers for new payment models and provide some benchmarking to illustrate the current performance of our healthcare delivery and financing system. Next, I'll share CareFirst's unique approach to collaboration with our healthcare delivery partners. Then, I'll talk about where I see value-based care going into the future, which is really the future state of healthcare delivery and financing. Let's kick off with the first segment. How did we get here? Health insurance carriers have negotiated fee-for-service rates with their contracted network of providers for decades. Then, as costs escalated, carriers implemented countermeasures to protect against waste, fraud, abuse, and sometimes well-intended care provided but influenced by moral hazard. Costs continued to grow at a rate that outpaced inflation in the general economy, driving up premiums and out-of-pocket costs for purchasers and consumers. This is what we would expect in a volume-based payment model. Carriers were part of the problem too. For-profit carriers need to meet investor expectations and non-profit carriers need to compete with the for-profits, but with less access to capital. Some carriers were spending a small portion of the premium dollar for their members' health care, retaining a larger share for administration and profit. Then the government stepped in. Beginning in the 2011 plan year, carriers became subject to medical loss ratio or MLR requirements. I'll use the larger employer group segment as an example here. These plans require that 85% of the premiums collected must be spent on health care. So, for $10 million in premiums collected, only $1.5 million is available for the carrier to issue cards, manage call centers, maintain claim systems, provide care management and quality improvement support, and within this, any margin. If care costs came in at $7 million, the carrier would be required to issue rebates to the customers in the amount of $1.5 million to true up the amount of spent on care to 85% of the premium dollar. Let's be clear. The most well-known reforms of the Affordable Care Act were health insurance reforms. There were provisions in the bill that were intended to drive health care reforms, many of which have fostered the new environment of payer-provider collaboration that we have today. MLR requirements limited insurers' ability to make margins, but this didn't fix the problem. The underlying cost of health care continued to increase at a rate that is not sustainable. So the market responded in another way. Hello, high deductible health plans, sometimes euphemistically called consumer directed health care. High deductible health plans are a reasonable and predictable response to employers' need to manage the growth in their health care costs for employees and their dependents. You can have a $50 per employee per month increase in your premiums next year, or you can implement a $2,500 deductible and see only a $20 increase per employee. The employer saves $30 per employee per month, and the employee gets to spend $2,500 of their income on health care. Maybe that will make you a little more thoughtful when you get sick, right? Consumers tend to do this too. They often choose the plan with the lowest premium, regardless of whether it provides the most value for their specific health care needs. But it did not make consumers more thoughtful. Findings from a recent Acosca healthcare survey show that 64% of respondents have never sought out pricing information for health care services. There is little consumer direction in consumer-directed healthcare. Then, some thoughtful public policy, trying to help, reduced the sting a bit by creating tax-sheltered health savings account. At least the $2,500 that was cost-shifted to the employee will be pre-tax now. 
Now enter the unintended consequences. A family of four making $55,500 per year is at 200% of the federal poverty level. If someone in this family has a serious medical issue, they have little chance of being able to satisfy their deductible. If the issue continues into a second plan year, they will have to satisfy the deductible again. This family member will likely avoid seeking diagnosis or treatment as long as possible. When they do seek care, it may be a function of no longer being able to push through the issue. They may present to the healthcare system in worse condition, impairing their ability to have the best possible outcome. Once diagnosed, they may avoid or delay treatments or prescription fills because they cannot afford them. When this happens, they may present in an emergency situation, perhaps repeatedly, further driving up costs and worse, doing significant damage to their long-term health. When all is said and done, this family has accumulated debilitating medical debt and the provider has a bill that is unlikely to be collected. By contrast, if a single person earning $100,000 a year has the same plan with the same deductible, they will likely manage to cover their out-of-pocket costs, not avoid needed care, setting up the best possible chance for a good health outcome. These financial models are at the root of much of the health inequity in this country. And the root cause of these financial models is a predictable and expected response by organizations funding healthcare to the unsustainable rate of rise in cost. Again, it all loops back to the underlying cost of providing the healthcare service. Note that I said the cost of healthcare, not the cost of health insurance. With medical loss ratio, we've already established that the growth in cost of health insurance is a direct reflection of the increase in the cost of health care. How do factors create this environment impact on provider business dynamics? We can all agree economic models drive business models. The effect of fee-for-service, benefit designs, and the perception of a competitive environment drives healthcare delivery organizations to drive more volume. We shouldn't be surprised. We pay for volume and we get volume. The effect of all this on patient behavior is largely dependent on individual socioeconomic circumstances. Those with sufficient means do not generally experience problems accessing healthcare. The Commonwealth Fund's State of U.S. Health Insurance in 2022 reported that 43% of working age adults were inadequately insured. 46% skipped or delayed care because of cost. 49% reported that they would not be able to pay a unexpected medical bill of $1,000 within 30 days. According to the Annals of Internal Medicine, one in five adults with diabetes have skipped, delayed, or used less insulin than was needed to save money. Those struggling to cover their usual monthly bills are often devastated by just a few encounters with the healthcare delivery system. Why am I going through all this background? because recent history forms the call to action for payers and providers to collaborate going forward. The United States economy totals up to about $21 trillion annually. Of that, we spend about $4 trillion on healthcare. That is nearly 20% of the gross domestic product of this country and rising. That means every good, every unit of service produced in this country has a 20% healthcare load before it hits the market. Now, we're in a global economy. So it's reasonable to ask if other developed countries have a similar healthcare burden on their economies. They do not. In the United States, we spend approximately $12,000 per person per year on healthcare. Consumers see this show up clearly in their payroll deduction for health insurance, but it is also in their payroll taxes, as well as their federal, state, and local taxes. Developed countries such as France, Germany, the United Kingdom, and Canada spend about $5,000 per person annually on healthcare. Imagine how much more competitive the United States could be in the global economy if we could save just a little bit on healthcare. Imagine the jobs that we could return to our shores. We're often told that we have the best healthcare system in the world. So when we see this price difference per person per year, we can rationalize it, right? Wrong. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, of the countries I just listed, the United States has the shortest life expectancy, the highest infant mortality rate, the highest percentage of adults reporting a medical error or delay in treatment, and the lowest scores on the quality and access index. In summary, we have the most expensive, worst performing, least equitable healthcare system in the developed world. And if you add an aging population, longer lifespans, and advancing technology all in a volatile economy, we have a full-blown crisis on our hands. So you wanna know why payers and providers must collaborate to save this country. So what is the role of the health plan in all this? And how can health plans and healthcare delivery organizations collaborate to improve the state of coverage and care? I view my role as one of consumer advocacy. 
When I negotiate with a healthcare delivery partner of any size, from solo practitioner to major health system, I'm representing the healthcare needs of millions of people who have chosen Blue Cross Blue Shield in this region as their health insurance carrier. My fiduciary duty is to negotiate the best possible terms for those consumers, balancing affordability, access, quality, and consumer experience. The physician practices, hospitals, and integrated health systems are not subject to something like a medical loss ratio. So it's important that the carrier is aware of the opportunity to drive more efficiencies or greater value in each negotiation. Our role must be to create that incentive for efficiency and affordability. Historically, these negotiations have been pretty one-dimensional. The physician practice or health system would request an X percent raise in the next contract year, essentially to do the same thing in the same way with the same results as the previous year. This is a negotiating toolbox with only one tool. Value-based care, also called advanced payment models, are new approaches health plans are using to negotiate with healthcare delivery partners. This adds many tools to the toolbox to drive better value and improved outcomes for each incremental additional dollar invested in healthcare. Like medical loss ratios and high deductible health plans, the national push to value-based care began with the federal government. The passage of the Affordable Care Act established the CMS Innovation Center, or CMMI, in 2010. The agency began talking about the triple aim, which means better quality, lower cost, better consumer experience, and has tested a number of advanced payment models, new approaches to funding healthcare delivery that drive focus on that triple aim. The work of CMMI, plus the growth of the Medicare Advantage program and its similar triple aim requirements in the last decade, have raised awareness and acceptance for payers and providers in all market segments of the need for new contracting models. CareFirst began collaborating with thousands of physicians and hundreds of practices in a new way when it launched its first value-based model in January of 2011. The primary care-focused patient-centered medical home program changed the way CareFirst contracted with primary care physicians. Each group of doctors now had a cost and quality target to meet in a given calendar year, and if they met the quality standards and beat the cost target, the practices were eligible for material incentive payments. One of our early findings was that it was not effective to sign a contract with a physician practice and hope for the best. In 2011, the physicians had never seen claims data. They had never seen the quality results on their population. They did not know which of their patients were most vulnerable and therefore most in need of their support we quickly realized that the practices needed analytic support, practice transformation support, and supplemental clinical resources to manage their highest risk patients. These early findings formed the basis of the last decade's work with CareFirst collaborating with our partners to help them be successful in their value-based programs. By 2019, we were frequently hearing from our primary care partners that they wished for more alignment between them, the specialists, and the hospitals. Throughout 2019, CareFirst set about creating an accountable care organization model for health systems and an episode of care program for specialists. This required new talent to support the intense collaboration that is needed. We now have three teams dedicated to analytics and practice transformation. One team focused on the large integrated delivery systems and ACO contracts, one focused on independent specialty practices, and one, the original one, focused on independent primary care practices. This level of collaboration requires raw claims data feeds, sophisticated utilization and cost reporting, financial support and reconciliation, quality measure reporting, and solid relationship management. Instead of the old negotiate the unit cost and see you again in three years model, we now have a basis for ongoing collaboration on a particular healthcare delivery partner's performance on their care first population. An ongoing conversation about continuous improvement where the parties are aligned in the best interest of the patient and whoever's covering the cost of care for that patient. At the front line, we're meeting weekly, in some cases daily, with practice leadership and frontline clinicians. At the middle management level, we're meeting monthly to review data, direct resources, and manage any issues that arise. At the executive level, we meet quarterly to track progress, remove barriers faced by our respective teams, and manage any escalated issues. This multi-level sponsorship of transformation process is key to progress. These new forms of relationships foster an environment of new conversations. We're talking about supply and demand in healthcare with our partners. We have oversupply of some services in some geographies and an appalling lack of supply in others. In our area, we have overbuilt ASCs and urgent care centers while not adding sufficient capacity to primary care and the specialties that treat common chronic illnesses. The discipline of regular collaboration that comes from these value-based contracts is opening the doors to these important conversations. So, providers want to, and may need to, improve their economics. 
and those funding healthcare are saying they've had enough and can't pay anymore. The carrier is stuck smack dab in the middle of this. Value-based care is a mechanism to pay providers for better value and outcomes. And those funding healthcare are generally willing to pay more for effective care that prevents waste in the near term or massive increases in spending in the long term. This is called bending the cost curve or slowing the rate of rise of healthcare costs over time. Using existing funding in the healthcare system, we can finance the transition from a volume-based system to a value-based system. And the collaboration that these arrangements demand from the parties form the basis for them to figure out how to continuously improve together. All right, we're coming to the end, the last segment. Where is value-based care going into the future? From my vantage point, what we call value-based care today, or advanced payment models, evolve into common practice for the purchasing of healthcare delivery services. It just becomes the contract. While many current models run on a fee-for-service platform with results judged on a periodic basis, these are the training wheels for carriers and healthcare delivery organizations alike. As the parties become more comfortable that they know what is needed to predictably manage to target from year to year, they begin to evolve to population-based payments or bundles. What we're talking about is evolving the healthcare sector, nearly 20% of our economy, to act like other sectors of the economy where good performance is rewarded. Outcome-based contracts are not new. One must actually wonder why we haven't been doing them in healthcare all along. The future state of healthcare financing and delivery is in payments to providers for a broader suite of services on a defined population with standards to deliver on access, quality, consumer satisfaction, and outcomes included in the agreements. For example, an endocrinology practice might be paid a predictable monthly sum to oversee and support the care for a cohort of diabetic patients. And the practice would, in turn, commit to the achievement of certain outcomes for that population. There would be no payment based on the number of visits if those visits were conducted by phone, video conference, or in person. It would not matter if the physician participated in every visit or if the nurse was most appropriate for the clinical presentation on a particular day. The fee-for-service requirements that the system is so tuned to today is what causes much of the inefficiency in the healthcare delivery system. New payment models alleviate those requirements, enable practice at the top of license, enable the use of multiple communication modalities, reduce or eliminate cost barriers, and provide a better experience to consumers. I'm not sure what we'll call this approach in the future. It seems like smarter buying of services to me, but in this business, I'm sure we'll come up with a snappy acronym. Never has an industry been more ripe for disruption while simultaneously difficult to disrupt. In McKinsey's September 2022 paper, The Gathering Storm, The Uncertain Future of U.S. Healthcare, the authors note that the emerging operating environment will demand care delivery transformation, improved clinical productivity, technology enablement, and administrative simplification. We agree. Gallup's 2022 report on healthcare in America, in partnership with West Health, tells us what the American public thinks of the United States healthcare system in a letter grade format. We get a C minus overall, a D minus for cost of care, a D plus for equitable care, a C for access to care, and a C plus for quality of care. These are our customers. We are accountable to the people who participated in this survey, and they say we have much work to do. This work can only be accomplished through the coming together of health insurance payers and healthcare delivery organizations to innovate in ways that create more value and improve outcomes for our society's investment in healthcare. Thank you for your time and attention today. If you're one of the innovators, one of those passionate about making productive change, one of the people at the table working to collaborate for a better system, one of those who can put self-interest aside to serve a higher mission, I wish you all the best in your endeavors. And thanks again to Fawn and the team at Modern Healthcare for the opportunity to share our experience with payer-provider collaboration and value-based care as a tool for shared progress.